and our subject is the first African profession of faith, at least recorded in the scripture. And we come to this point of the record and from Samaria, where the Lord has mightily used him, Philip, who is almost an apostle, certainly an apostolic assistant, no doubt one who has acted under the instructions of the apostles and is closely associated with them. And Philip here receives instruction from the angel of the Lord. And he spake unto Philip, says the record, saying, Arise and go toward the south. He's been toward the north of Jerusalem, of course, and now he's turned round and perhaps he went back to Jerusalem with the apostles as recorded in the earlier verses but now he's directed southward and uh, first heading in this brief study is that the commission of Christ the great commission is now to be completely implemented or at least the beginning of the mission to the Gentiles and at the very beginning of this book in chapter 1 and in verse 8, the Lord, the risen Lord, says, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, and that had taken place, and great crowds had come to the Lord. Probably the church in Jerusalem consisted of 25 to 30,000 people. In Jerusalem and in all Judea, and that was underway, and in Samaria, and through the agency, the instrumentality of Philip, that had been begun, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And would Philip ever have imagined that he would be the one called to nominally, formally begin the great mission to the Gentiles? And it is quite remarkable how Luke, under inspiration in the book of Acts, prepares the way for the mission to the Gentiles. Fully brought into motion by chapter 13 in the sending out from Antioch, the missionaries Paul and Barnabas. But here is really the beginning of that thread. So the angel of the Lord addresses Philip. Why did Philip have such a, a signal instruction, an unusual instruction from God to be personally addressed? There doesn't seem to have been an appearance of the angel of the Lord, but Philip had, at least in his heart, a clear understanding that he was addressed. That doesn't happen today, of course, in quite this way. Philip was practically an apostle. The scripture was by no means complete. And God still spoke in remarkable ways to his servants at that time. The 17th century confessions of faith all speak of how God has inspired his word. And his word is complete. And that God doesn't speak anymore in the way in which he did until the completion of the word of God. All former ways of God speaking to his people having now ceased. And that is where we get the term cessationism from. The ceasing of the gifts in the, at, with the close of the apostolic era and the completion of the scripture. And of course it's obvious it should be so. If God were still speaking authoritatively and perhaps with new doctrine or new aspects of doctrine even today, then the scripture would no longer be the yardstick of all things, the final authority in all spiritual disputes and matters of faith because it will be being added to in bits and pieces here and there. And how would we know? How would we have the remotest idea which person who claimed to be inspired of the Spirit really was? 
How would we know the difference between the genuine and the phony? There'd be utter confusion and no stable doctrine in the, in the Christian church at all. But God closed the scripture. It was complete, inspired, wonderful, all sufficient for our every need and our every spiritual issue. So God doesn't speak in that way now. Mark you, this isn't, this isn't my subject. God does communicate with us in gentle and wonderful ways. And I often say these things. The Spirit of God frequently prompts us with various things, doesn't speak authoritatively, new scripture, new truth, like so many of the charismatics imagine. But sometimes when you're reminded of things that are so very important in your life and testimony and your diligence even in employment, it is the Spirit of God who helps you and you thank him. And certainly when your conscience is moved, when you're about to sin, it's the Spirit of God who nudges you and activates your conscience. And when you have a good intention, I must speak to that person. I have the opportunity. He is a lost soul. She is a lost, wandering person. And I must seek an, an opportunity of witness. Well, that's of the Spirit of God that you've been prompted. You can never be certain, of course. It isn't authoritative. Don't be one of those people who wanders about saying, the Spirit of God told me to tell you this, or moved me to do this, or definitely guided me to do that. You can never be certain, but you can pretty well be sure that God is at work when you're prompted to do good things and spiritual duties, when you're wonderfully reminded of the very scriptures you need in times of need, or when you're trying to help someone, you give credit to the Lord and thank him. And now, Philip was communicated with directly. Well, why? Well, because... Uh, Probably he would never have presumed to be the first to go to the Gentiles to start this mission. Who am I? This is apostolic work. I am just a junior, an assistant, an evangelist, a preacher. So God urged him. Maybe some have suggested this. The apostles were too hesitant. They weren't getting adequate witness to the Gentiles underway soon enough. That may be a wrong chart. The apostles, well, their hands were full. The time wasn't right, but three or four years had elapsed since Pentecost, since the instruction of the risen Lord. But whether the apostles were to any degree at fault or not, we must give the benefit of, de of the doubt. Say so they were made much too busy by the Lord in the work among Jews and now Samaritans. But God speaks to Philip. He doesn't know what's going to happen. That's the implication of the record. He doesn't know where he's being sent. One minute in the north, now down to the south of Jerusalem. He's just told where to go, which road, and to expect something in a desert place along the road. And so he goes. And there in this verse, verse 27, he arose and went, and behold, that behold, it, it suggests here in this context something surprising, something unexpected to him. Behold, ah, this is it, he thought. This is why the Lord has sent me here. A man of Ethiopia. But what a man. The experts tell us the particular people in northern Sudan, where this was located at the time, I would have been... Tall people, big bone, big built, men and women. But here's a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch. Some people say he wasn't uh, necessarily literally a eunuch. It might now, in those past times and in that, those places, uh, these uh, kings and queens, when they had high officials, they often were eunuchs and then they couldn't be rivals and set their children on the throne and so on. Because they wouldn't have children. 
a eunuch. So he may literally have been so, or it may by this time have been just a term used to describe such an official. Well, we'll take it literally, in any doubt, a eunuch of great authority, which means a very princely man and a ruler under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. That's a kind of uh, hereditary title name. All the queens were called Candace. He had charge of all her treasure, probably the Chancellor of the Exchequer of the country, one would think, and he'd come to Jerusalem for to worship. He may have been what was called a proselyte. And he was, uh, he turned to the Jewish faith. Maybe just an inquirer, you can't be certain. But anyway, a deeply thinking man who seems to have given up the uh, religion of his region and had come to inquire or come with perhaps some degree of understanding to worship. And Philip realized, it's me. I am called of God to speak to this man, this ruler, this African, this Gentile. And he bowed his head in prayer and prepared himself. Well, the eunuch, the chancellor, if you like, verse 28, was returning. And he was returning on the road south of Jerusalem to Gaza. First step in going back to Egypt and then beyond to northern Sudan, the Ethiopia of those times. He was returning and amazingly sitting in his chariot reading Isaiah. And shortly we're told exactly what he was reading. He was sitting reading in his chariot. Of course somebody else was driving it. He had servants. He was a man of authority. He had a retinue. Who knows how many people to protect him on the road and to keep him on his journey. And he's reading Isaiah, the prophet. Wonderful. And the Spirit says, verse 29, unto Philip, go near, join thyself to this chariot. And he ran to catch up with the chariot and he heard him read the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah. And he said to him, understandest thou what thou readest? And the Greek suggests the way the words are put, that he expected a negative reply. Do you really understand what you're reading? The way the Ethiopian Chancellor, Prince, was reading, probably suggested he had little understanding. He was reading aloud. He would have been reading slowly. How do we know that? Well, it wasn't easy to read the Greek. He was reading the Greek translation of the Old Testament, at least the portion, Isaiah. And you know, the text he was reading would have had no punctuation, and there were no spaces between the words. All the characters ran together. You couldn't read it as easily as we read modern print. Of course, it was hand script, and so he probably read it slowly, with co concentration, falteringly, and maybe because he didn't fully understand what he was reading, maybe there was a sort of metallic tone in his voice, or complete tonelessness and evenness, no sense of meaning. And so Philip says to him, more politely than it sounds when I put it like this, do you really understand what you're reading? And the man says, how can I? How can I? Unless someone helps me, someone guides me. This man was a man of great authority. In the culture of the times, an ordinary person like Philip approaches his chariot and he says to him uh, with great humility, how can I? unless somebody guides me. Already there is a preparatory work of God, it would seem, in his heart. He's humbled, he's open, he's concerned, he's anxious. I imagine, may I just add to the narrative a bit, this is pure speculation, 
I imagine he says to Philip, this is very beautiful. This is quite amazing. I've never seen anything like this. I've never read of a person who humiliated and abased and brought to execution would say nothing, would do it voluntarily, would be led as a lamb to the slaughter. Wasn't the culture of the times? And he read the text. Look at it. The place, verse 32, the place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. Actually, this brings us to a kind of second heading, doesn't it? The commission of the Lord is now about to be implemented. The great mission to the Gentiles is going to begin. It's going to begin with an individual. Up till now, great crowds had been saved. 3,000 on the day of Pentecost. 5,000 just a matter of days later. Then more and more. A great host, the scripture says. Thousands of them. Yes, but you know, it won't necessarily... Don't think of thousands. Some people do. They're not content. And of course, we love this. We want this to be so. But they're not content unless scores of people are gathered in and all saved at the same time. Yes, the Lord can do that and often does do that. But everybody comes as an individual, one by one. Look at the contrasts in the record of Luke. The thousands and the Gentile mission begins with an individual. He's a noble individual. He's a significant and important individual from a distant place, but an individual. Up till now, the record is all about preaching, preaching, preaching. Now it's about witness. Yes, it's a preacher who's doing it, but it's about witness. Witness is as important. Almost incidentally, the record seems to say the Gentile mission will act with an act of individual witness. And that will light the torch in a whole new region. Beyond Egypt, in Africa, but it'll be by witness to an individual. Do you do contact work? Do you witness individually to relations, to colleagues? This is how the whole worldwide Gentile mission started. Excuse me. With an individual. It's so important. And you see here how God blesses the work of an individual in person-to-person -person witness. Never despise it. It was the beginning of everything on record as far as Gentiles were concerned. But the second heading really which we come to is this. What was the core of that witness? It was Calvary. Calvary is always the core of all witness. Very sad when somebody perhaps gives an evangelistic address and Calvary is left out. How can it be? A speaker gives an anniversary address before a department of the Sunday school for children and Calvary is left out. How sad. Right at the very beginning of the vast worldwide Gentile mission, the core of the act of witness was Calvary. And it was the Lord who, if my, I may put it in this way, set it up to be so. Verse 32, the place of the scripture which he read, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter. Who was this man? Asks that African national chancellor. Who was this man? Is uh, the prophet speaking about himself? He'd been to Jerusalem, maybe as an important personage. He'd been attended to by the clergy in Jerusalem. The priests, the scribes, the Pharisees, the rulers there, maybe they'd received him. Perhaps he'd asked them this question. Who does Isaiah refer to? Now probably, if he had, they would have given this kind of an answer. Well, he is speaking of himself. 
That was what they thought among the Jews at that time. It was quite wrong. He was speaking of Christ, the Messiah. It's obvious, once you know. He was speaking of himself, but he was speaking of himself, not only literally, they would have told him, but in a symbolic way. He was speaking of himself as a representative of all the prophets. So this man who is humiliated, who is opposed, pictures all the prophets. Well, that was certainly true. The Israelites treated their prophets extremely badly and they didn't listen to them by and large and they didn't glean Christ from their teaching. But nevertheless, it was wrong. So he says, does he speak of himself or does he speak of some other? He's smarter than the clergy in Jerusalem. This foreign prince, if you like, chancellor. He can see, it's obvious as you read Isaiah 53, he isn't speaking about himself. And so he asks him. And that's just the opportunity that Philip desires and requires. But look at verse 33 before we proceed. In his humiliation... His judgment was taken away. It was an unjust thing when Christ was executed. And who shall declare his generation? Or who shall fully recount his generation? Who shall fully describe his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the sense, the meaning is this, that he's going to have... This man who voluntarily, quietly, without protest, goes to his execution, is going to have, well, an issue, descendants, many of them. He's going to father a generation. Who can count it is literally what the original asks. Who can measure it? Who can put a figure on it? But how can that be? The Ethiopian Chancellor seems to ask. If he's executed, how can he have an issue? A generation, a numerous people, so numerous that it cannot be described, accounted for. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. You may think superficially, the way our rendering puts it, that it means who shall speak about his issue or family because he won't have one, because he'll be executed. But it doesn't mean that. It means who can count, describe his issue because he'll be executed. Who is this man, asked the Chancellor, who by death gives rise to children, to a generation. And Philip explains to him Christ Jesus and what he's accomplished through his death and the great company that will be brought into being, saved by the grace of Christ. Verse 35, Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Yes, it says he preached, but of course it was an act of personal witness. When he preached, there would be thousands. When Philip preached so often, vast crowds, and he lifted up his voice, and he projected it, and with great feeling and earnestness he preached to the crowd. Well, he couldn't do that to this noble African. He preached... He spoke sincerely and relatively quietly, but all the passion of his preaching was represented in that witness. His feeling for the man's lost soul was quite apparent. His desire for him, the earnestness and the certainty with which he spoke about Christ, who was the saviour of the world, who'd come and suffered and died in agony on Calvary, and borne the sins and the punishment of those who would be redeemed. 
and all his feeling and his concern and his certainty. So it's quite reasonable for Luke to use the word preached and a good act of witness. It doesn't shout, it doesn't bawl, it doesn't intimidate, it doesn't pressurize, but yet there's certainty and concern and feeling there and affection and all that certainly came through. Philip opened his mouth, began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. He spoke about sin. He spoke about the redeeming work of Christ. His text was in Isaiah 53. It was all focused on Calvary. And that is our work. We believe that no one comes to Christ but for the overruling, irresistible, kind, merciful work of the Holy Spirit in the heart. And yet it's the will of God that everyone in whose heart the Spirit works will be personally and consciously convinced of their need. And to us is given precious instrumentality to represent God to represent his heart of love, to appeal to and reason and remonstrate with poor lost sinners for all we're worth. And Calvary is at the heart of it. We're bringing people to the death of Christ and showing his love and his power. And as they went on their way, verse 36, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, see, here is water. Well, it would have been wonderful to see this man's conversion, even as Philip spoke. Do you think his tall, big frame shook with feeling as he heard about a saviour, as he took in that God had come and suffered in human flesh in terrible agony? For him, did he perhaps shed a tear as he felt his sinfulness and the great love of Christ? But he understood, his eyes were opened. He looked amazed at that 53rd chapter of Isaiah. He saw it, he got it, and his heart was regenerated as he heard the word and he came to Christ. And then Philip must have spoken about baptism. Maybe he told him anecdotally about the baptisms in Jerusalem and the baptisms in Samaria and how people left the old life and how it spoke of death to the old life down into the grave and it symbolized that and resurrection to a new life with Christ walking with him and at that point they come to water it's a desert road it's parched land and here is water I imagine but it's only my imagination that there were people there drawing water people sitting around the water perhaps that there were some trees, that there was just some area to which people would come naturally or other travellers would stop and hesitate. That's just my imagination. I don't see a desert waste and just a pool in my mind. But maybe that's all it was, who knows? And the Ethiopian Chancellor says, here is water. What hinders my baptism? It's a pity, isn't it, that today many people are not so eager to obey the Lord, not just in baptism, but in wholehearted commitment in love to him and to his service. This man, he wasn't used to obeying. He was used to giving the orders. But now he's found Christ. And Christ, though he's a ten-minute-old Christian, is everything to him. Here is water. What prevents me from saying my old life has died? 
I'm his and I'll follow him wherever he leads me. Obey the Lord if you've come to him, if you've trusted him, serve him, show it. That's what he'd have you do. Well, then you get this great profession of faith. And this will be a kind of third and final heading. The profession of faith of the first recorded Gentile convert. Certainly the first African convert. Here it is. Verse 37, Philip says, If thou believest with all thine heart, I emphasize that, thou mayest. If thou believest, if you believe, that's first. Do you believe in Christ? Do you believe he's the Son of God? Do you believe he came in accordance with the eternal counsel of the Godhead before the foundation of the world, when God who knew all things, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God and three distinct persons, all totally united and equally God, and yet wonderfully distinct, when in that eternal counsel, they determined that man who they knew would fall and be lost should be saved and millions should be converted and the way to achieve it because God just cannot overlook sin was that Christ the second person of the Godhead not second in authority they're all equal not second in status or stature or attributes because all are wonderfully equal but the second person of the Godhead for us to conceive and to understand determined to come into this world here am I he said to the father send me I will die for them I will purchase their salvation I will take their guilt upon me and suffer the eternal punishment and then I will rise again from the dead and be eternally different. I'll wear in glorified form that human body and personality that I took upon myself at incarnation and be their everlasting King and Saviour in glory. And he came and suffered and died. That's what Philip preached to the Ethiopian Chancellor. Do you believe? I believe Christ is the Son of God. Do you believe in his atoning death? Do you believe that all are lost and condemned and sinful and dependent upon the atoning death of Christ? He died to take the punishment for our sin so we don't have to go to hell and he lived a perfect life of righteousness to earn heaven for us so that we can go to heaven. Do you believe in him? I do. Do you believe in his words that you must repent of your sin? I do. Do you believe in his authority and his kinship so that you will obey him? I do. When you believe in Christ, you believe in him as your king, not just your saviour, but your king and your Lord. And he was able to say that he believed. And do you believe in him with all your heart or is half your heart still somewhere else I believe in him I believe in his death for sinners I believe that only he can save I believe he's wonderful but I believe in this world too I'm not going to give up my worldly entertainments I'm not going to give up my personal selfish ambitions. I'm not going to give up my love to be seen and admired. I'm not going to give up these things, my worship of earthly celebrities. My heart is partly for him and partly for me and this world. Do you believe in him with all your heart? You love him. You desire him. You desire a life in union with him.
and you'll surrender all the other things to second place, third place, fourth place. Do you believe this is the profession that Philip wanted to hear? Have you given all of yourself to him? Do you believe in him with all your heart? And he answered and said, end of verse 37, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Yes, with all my heart, all that he is, all that he's done, and he will be my Lord and my King. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more. That's a pity in a way, isn't it? Wouldn't Philip have longed to talk further and further, to ask so many questions? to have the word open more, to hear more about his wonderful saviour. But no, Philip had to go. The eunuch couldn't hear those things from him. But he was secure, because although it would have been nice to have further... By the way, it's very quick, the baptism in Bible times. You're saved, you're baptised. We're not so quick today. We take our time today. Why do you take your time, Pastor? What's your scriptural authority for that? Well, you know, when the gospel was preached and people were converted at that time, it was very hard to be a Christian. If you were a Jew, you could be thrown out of your house. Many were. You would be despised. It was an act of national treason to receive Christ. It was a very hard thing. It was much more likely if a person professed Christ and took the consequences, you knew exactly that there'd been a work of grace in their heart. You could baptize them at once. Same with the Gentiles. You were converted, you'd be thrown out of your trade guild. You wouldn't go to the feasts of the trade guild with all the idolatry and so on. You were out of it, you were out of your job. Your t home was most likely tied to your job, you were out of that. You were living by faith, it was a very, very hard thing to profess Christ. You could be baptised at once. Nowadays, you're converted to Christ we want to be sure. We do have a biblical responsibility not to rush, not to give spiritual succor and support and confidence to people who've only made a simple ascent. They haven't known what they were doing. There's no evidence they've really been saved. So we take a little longer. I can't give you an easy proof text, but however, we do have a responsibility to be careful. But some people wait much too long. There's no doubt about that. And that first act of obedience to the Lord, well, it can wait months or years too long. Anyway, I want to come to conclusion by just looking at this, uh, the end of verse 39. The eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing just reminds us that to be rejoicing believers dear friends I say this cautiously and carefully because some dear friends have personalities that are not helpful to them and maybe it's to do with their body chemistry maybe it's to do with how they are but they rejoice in a very somber way However, for the most of us, it is our duty to live as rejoicing Christians. You can't just turn it on, but you can be a rejoicing believer.
if you reflect more on the Lord and upon your privileges. You reflect more, you give thanks more, you praise him more, you walk with him more firmly and more obediently. That'll help you to be a rejoicing believer. And then you'll be a more powerful witness and you'll be protected from much sin and you'll be closer to the Lord. And Philip was found at Azotus and passing through he went on a kind of circular tour back to Caesarea which may well have been his home. And then I read the first verse of chapter 9 to anticipate our future thinking and Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter. Don't you see? Luke is moving to the opening up of the Gentile mission. The beginning of chapter 8, he's mentioned Saul. And Saul was consenting unto his death. Just a fleeting reference. Keep Saul in mind, he says. Then he tells you about Philip in Samaria. And then with the eunuch, the prince, chancellor, under Candace in Ethiopia. And then back to Paul. And Paul, in chapter 9, is the conversion of Paul. Then the narrative just goes back to Jerusalem. Then it goes on to deal with the conversion of a Gentile, Cornelius. And then you're back to Saul, who's now converted, and he's called into ministry at Antioch, and Antioch sends him out. You see how Luke's building up the narrative? Saul doesn't just arise from nowhere in chapter 13. He's introduced as an antagonist, an opponent, referred to his hostility, his conversion. Always appreciate the biblical narratives. They don't just hobble along, stumbling here, stumbling there. The Holy Spirit is working to a plan, and Luke is his instrument here, working to the great Gentile mission. It's beginning with an Ethiopian it's opening up into a great stream and river and torrent of blessing. That's the method. That's the system. But remember our headings this morning. So briefly, the commission is now implemented by one person to one pagan. Calvary is the core of the message. And the all-important outcome is a truly sincere profession of faith. May God encourage us and help us and challenge us in these things.